The Pulitzer Board has announced the winners of this year's Pulitzer Prize in all of its various categories. And if you're asking yourself, what masterpieces have they unearthed this year? What great artist has been saved from obscurity? Well, the wait is over. And the 2023 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry goes to... Carl Phillips for his collection, Then the War, and Selected Poems. On the Pulitzer website, Phillips is described as one of America's most essential, celebrated, and enduring poets. The description of his work says, The new poems, written in a time of rising racial conflict in the United States, with its attendant violence and uncertainty, find Phillips entering deeper into the landscape he has made his own, a forest of intimacy, queerness, and moral inquiry, where the farther we go, the more difficult it is to remember why or where we started. Um, okay, I think you get the idea. As usual, it's all about politics. Are they ever going to give this award to a classical poet ever again? Or just any mainstream award, for that matter? This and more on Classical Poets Live. <laughs> Hello, you're listening to Classical Poets Live, the only podcast about the contemporary poetry scene that emphasizes the good, the beautiful, and the true over identity politics and left-wing agendas. I'm your host, Andrew Benson Brown, member of the Society of Classical Poets, or SCP for short, the world's largest organization devoted to formal poetry, fighting the decline of the arts since 2012 which was, of course, the year that the Mayan apocalypse was supposed to happen, but didn't. Our doom has been forestalled for an indefinite period of time. The way things are going, it looks like that doom may be on the horizon. But until it does come, the SCP will be fighting to the bitter end. We're a bit like the string quartet on the Titanic. You know, they were playing to the very end as the ship was going down, except that we will be reciting sonnets as the volcanoes are erupting or whatever. So uh, we can be reached at classicalpoets.org. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And leave a comment at the bottom. If your comment is anachronistic and conveys an old-fashioned worldview that nobody subscribes to today, then I will read it on the show. And as it happens, I do have a few comments from our first episode. We have received our very first rating on Apple Podcast, a five-star rating from Katie at CAI. And Katie says, There are seemingly a billion podcasts nowadays, but amidst the cacophony of head-slamming slam poetry and endless true crime binging, this one stands alone, ushering in a little classical-tinged clarity. Well, thank you, Katie. I don't know anything about true crime podcasts, I must admit, not a listener. But my mother-in-law does watch way too many true crime documentaries. I think the fascination with murderers and criminals is a bit much. And then on the Society of Classical Poets YouTube channel, there is a comment from Deborah. Deborah says, thank you. As someone relatively new to the SCP site, the background information offered is quite helpful. I can put a face to it, the name. I don't find most of the other journal podcasts attractive for all of the reasons you stated, confusion, banners, senseless composition, to me. I'd rather incorporate beautiful messaging and thought in my days, not break my brain trying to make word salad work, then end up thoroughly frustrated, even irritated that I wasted my time. Well, thank you, Deborah. Word salad is indeed the enemy that we are facing. Later on the show, I'm going to be joined by Susan Jarvis Bryant a poet and a true wordsmith of our time, so I'm excited about that. But first, the Pulitzer. Uh, in the case of the winner, Carl Phillips, we're dealing with a word salad, as Deborah put it, that is entirely composed of iceberg lettuce. It is just so mundane and blah. I'm going to read just a snippet, and this is from the Pulitzer website. I'm a song, changing. I'm a light rain falling through a vast darkness toward a different darkness. 
I think you get the point there. I'm not going to read any more. I have read some of his other poems, and like so many poets of our time, it's mostly just dull prose. Uh, one struggles in vain to detect any kind of virtuosic imagery or wordplay or rhetorical devices that are sophisticated in any way. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not specifically resentful against Phillips. There's a lot of fake poets out there. I'm not even specifically resentful against the Pulitzers in particular. They just happened to be announced a few days ago, so it was convenient for me to talk about them. But I want to look at another finalist here. His name is Jay Hopler. He's a poet who actually died last year. He died of cancer. And his collection, Still Life, um, it deals with uh, his battle with cancer and questions of mortality and things of that nature. It has a lot of formal poetry. There are sonnets, there are epigrams. Uh, the book is really actually quite interesting. Uh, so I think Jay Hopler is actually not a fake poet, or at least was not. And he has an interesting style. I want to read one of his poems just to give a flavor of that style. This is called Benediction. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see it on the screen. The layout is important because it's not your traditional poem that's arranged in kind of a preordained stanza. The wind in swells through the wild rye rolls. The bright sky dulls. Over the hills, their green backs ringed with bluebells, sunset rung. Flaps a wingy shadow westward. A jay. Poor bird that no net met, nor gin it didn't love. Good luck, you luckless scrub, you. You dumb, you doomed, sucker. God bless. The music of language takes precedence over strict grammar. But in contrast with Carl Phillips, where the poems just seem like they spilled out of his brain as his fingers typed, Hopler's work displays more of an attention to craft, an obvious attention to craft. He's too grammatically wacky to ever be a poet that the average person could, of course, relate to. Uh, as Deborah's comment noted, there is a word salad quality to modernism. Um, although in Hopler's case, it's very thoroughly tossed word salad. It was evocative of, like I said, Cummings or maybe Wallace Stevens also. There's a lot of ingredients in this salad, unlike the iceberg lettuce salad of Phillips. But still, if you compare it to the past, you know, if you ask, what makes Michelangelo great? What's the big deal about Michelangelo? The big deal about Michelangelo is that even a peasant could look up at the Sistine ceiling and understand what it's about enough to appreciate the beauty and to be moved. You know, Shakespeare. Shakespeare's plays were attended by commoners. I mean, they didn't get the fancy seating. They had to stand on the floor. But you can enjoy a Shakespeare play, even though the language is difficult. Because there's murder and intrigue, there are sword fights. It's exciting. His plays are exciting to watch. And when you compare these classical artists with the modernists of today, with the paint thrown against the canvas or whatever, there's just no comparison. Today's poets are professors who write for other professors and are exclusively read by professorial types. And so, you know, these big poets, they're never going to be as popular as Robert Frost, who, by the way, won the Pulitzer Prize four times. He was popular and he was critically acclaimed. And that just doesn't really happen anymore today. The great poets are totally unknown and the bad poets are famous. Fortunately, there is an alternative to this mainstream malaise, which is why this podcast exists to promote that alternative. And that's why you need to get your hands on a copy of the Society of Classical Poets, journal number 11, the latest journal, which is available now on Amazon. The journal features a variety of formal verse on a variety of topics. It's not a fake diversity publication that talks about diversity, but is totally homogenous in style and content. And if you buy a copy, the proceeds will go towards saving a starving poet on the brink of imminent death. Somewhere out there, in this modern abyss of traffic and planes and skyscrapers, a poet is trying to pen his masterpiece, and the quill is about to fall from his hands. He just can't go on, but you can save him so that he can go on too.
write his masterpiece or her masterpiece, whatever. So that's where your money will go. Poet's promise. A poet's promise is worth a lot, by the way. In Dante's Inferno. Um, and now I would like to read a poem from the newest journal that will give a flavor of its contents. This is by Sally Cook. And this poem is called simply Writing a Poem. Our planet moves, and so do we, by forces that we cannot see. Rhyme, meter, always seem to track the rhythm of the planet. Lack of sense or sensibility inhibits our ability to see. In every fervent verse, loquacious, moderate, or terse, rhyme glues meter where it should be glued. The best of poets could unleash spasmodic movement when not in their normal state. But then, as darkness turns again to day, they speak to keep the dark away. Sally Cook is the winner of this year's International Poetry Competition, sponsored by the Society of Classical Poets. She's won numerous other awards. She's widely published. She is also, this is very interesting, in addition to being a poet, she's also a celebrated painter. So she's a poet and a painter, a veritable renaissance woman of our times. She paints in a magical realist style. If you're looking at the screen, you can see an example of what I'm talking about. And she's a very interesting person. I really wanted to have her on the show, but she hates computers and technology more generally, I think, which, you know, I can relate to that. Um, I don't really like technology either, honestly, but I adapt. Most formalist poets, beings of a bygone epoch, have been dragged kicking and screaming into the modern world. Adapt or die is the rule. But Sally Cook, alone among mortals, resists the onslaught of AI. So we can admire her for that. And I'll bear the brunt of learning the technology. So, you know, disappointed that she didn't want to come on. But as an alternative, I've thought of another way to have her on the show. We keep an email correspondence between us. And in these emails, she tells entertaining stories from her life. She's had a very long and rich life. And so, I'd like to begin this first segment about Sally Cook, which I've titled Emails from Sally, by talking a little bit about a poet that many of us know and despise, and that is Allen Ginsberg, another fake poet, this time of an earlier generation, the Beat Generation, author of the famous poem Howl, which is, honestly, it's on my personal list of the top five worst poems ever written. Not necessarily for its overall badness, because there have been a lot of bad poems written, right? But because of his nefarious influence, millions have been led astray by the specter of beat poetry. And I bring this up because Sally Cook, it turns out, once did humanity a great favor by preventing Allen Ginsberg from writing poetry, inadvertently. Her behavior wasn't malicious, it was actually due to generosity on her part. So I'm going to read this email now. Sally says, I once knew a man who had a small trucking business in NYC. His wife was a friend. He claimed to be the model for a character in one of Kerouac's books. Who knows? He did know most of the beat poets. I met them at his place. Even then, I sensed their posturing. But I had never met Allen Ginsberg, whose work I detested. And she continues, Larry River's wife had just divorced him and was living in the apartment behind ours. Um, a side note, Larry Rivers was an artist who has been called the godfather and grandfather of pop art. They had just had a baby and were moving out. She, Rivers' ex-wife, said she would leave the door open and we could take anything we wanted. The trucker guy, named Henry, had made out a list of artists in need of furniture and gave Larry the list of what was to go where. But there was one thing left that no one wanted. A television. Henry, the trucker guy, said that Ginsburg's TV had just broken, and he was bereft, unable to watch his game shows and his soaps. Always ready to help along the cause of literature, I said, Take it, Henry. Waiting to hear the result of my dastardly deed, several weeks later I heard from Henry that Ginsburg had stopped writing and was glued to the infernal machine. I had found a way to stop a bad writer from writing. Unfortunately, this had but a limited effect. But for only a few weeks, his output was lessened. While it is true Ginsburg was the recipient of a free TV, no one ever mandated that he watch the blasted thing. 
I like to think he had run through his limited repertoire and welcomed it as an excuse. <sighs> well, thank you, Sally. Great work. If you had never written any poetry or painted any paintings, your existence would still be justified by this generous act. Unfortunately, uh, Sally has created art, and in fact, she has a gallery showing that is going to be starting up here soon. If you're in the New York City area, you can go and see it. It is called Sally Cook, where fantasy has bloomed, painting and poetry since the 1960s. Curated by Julie Writer Green, it is located at the Eric Firestone Gallery on 40 Great Jones Street, New York, New York. The exhibition will be on from May 20th to June 30th, 2023. Hours are mid-afternoon gallery hours. Okay, it's time to talk with Susan Jarvis Bryant. Uh, Susan is originally from Kent in the UK, but she now lives on the coastal plains of Texas. She has poetry published in Lighten Up Online, Snakeskin, Light, Sparks of Calliope, Expansive Poetry Online, Trinacria, and other places. The list just keeps going on. Uh, but the main point you should take away here is that she's widely published. Uh, Susan has been nominated for the 2022 Pushcart Prize and is the first place winner of the 2020 International Poetry Competition sponsored by the Society of Classical Poets, which... Uh, as I say that, I'm I'm thinking maybe we need to come up with a punch or name for that. It's kind of a mouthful. So welcome, Susan. Uh, Susan, uh, what do you Thank think you of changing well. the... <laughs> yes. What do you think of changing the name of the Society of Classical Poets International Poetry Competition to something punchier like the Mantic Prize? That's my vote. Yes, that <laughs> sounds very good. It is rather a mouthful. And that does sound punchy, the Mantic Prize. Yes, that has a nice that. ring to it. Perhaps in years to come, the coveted Mantic Prize will amass the same status recognition as the Pulitzer garners today, even though it's you know, it's kind of becoming a joke. Uh, you know, we're in this phase where name recognition still has this ring of, ooh, ah, you know, you went to Harvard or Yale, but you know, really the institutions have become kind of hollowed out. Um, what are your thoughts on this as someone who, of course, was nominated for a major award, the Pushcart Prize? Do you, do you pay attention to any of these big winners? Not really. I think that uh, with the Pulitzer Prize, just looking at them over the years, they seem to me a little political and mm. I don't check the boxes of the Pulitzer. I've gone out there on a radical route of rhyme, rhythm, rapture, and mm. uh, that's it. I'm far too, you know, uh, yeah, far too radical. I'm a heretic when it comes to poetry, you see. Right, right. So, I mean, of course, all the, you know, the top poets, it seems like, you know, they're mostly professors and it's a very elitist club. And if you don't fall in line with their ideology, or if you don't have their background, then you kind of, you know, you get, you get shut out. And it's, exactly. it's kind of the opposite of the inclusive philosophy that they trumpet, really. Um, exactly. It but of course, fun out of it, you know? it does. It really does. Talk about the Pushcart Prize a little bit. Do you know which journal, which journal nominated for you for that? Because I don't think the Society of Classical Poets is allowed to nominate people for the Pushcart Prize, are they? I don't know. I don't know. I was nominated uh, from one of my poems in Trinacria. For the oh, Pushcart Trinacria. Prize. So okay. I think if you're published, you know, somebody publishes uh, your stuff, um, they can nominate you. Right. I'm, on, I'm given to understand there's, what, six, you know, the different journals. You have to be kind of a small press, but you can yes. nominate up to six people. See, now you, you have two new poetry collections out, which are your first. I want to talk about that in a little bit. But first, maybe just a little bit about your life. Now, now this is interesting, Susan. I read, I read this in, on the back of your bio for one of your books, um, that you met your Texas husband, Mike, while you were publishing your poetry online. So what, you met on a poetry forum or something? Is that right? Yes, I did. We met on po Poem Hunter, and the only reason I met him is because uh -huh. I did my uh, English literature degree as a mature mm -hmm. student, and one of the courses was creative writing, and I had to publish online. So, lo and behold, there was a plumber in Texas publishing his poetry at the same time, mm -hmm. and uh, we got chatting, and I, I wasn't looking for a husband. I was just looking for a place for my poetry, but it changed right. my life completely. That's great. The power of poetry to bring people together. Yes. yes exactly. In so many the different ways. Yes. Um, 
Of course, you know, I'm, I'm officially going to be divorced one week from now. So I need to find my own poetry wife here. I need to, I don't know, yeah. get on the dating app for formalist poets if they have one of those. But you know, <laughs> probably not. Do you know, my tip for that would be when you send your words out there, the mm -hmm. right one will hear them. And That's right. I hope so. Yes. You just got to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Let's see. I think it's, you know, it's interesting. Oh, no, keep going. No, I was going to say that it's good to share poetry in common, I think. I think Absolutely. that's a wonderful subject, you know. That form of communication, I think, is the um, equation for a good marriage, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, you know, I think this is interesting about your husband, too, that he's, uh, you know, you mentioned that he is a mm -hmm. plumber by trade. And, uh, you know, I've got a friend who's a plumber. Who, uh, he's, I've got a friend who's a plumber. He's not interested in poetry at all. He's not a plumber poet. But he was interested in listening to this podcast or expressed interest in it. So now that we're talking about a real plumber poet, maybe yes. he'll be interested. Yes. Um, yeah. Now, how – so you guys met on the poetry forum. Now, how did you actually get into poetry? Can you pinpoint the exact moment you fell in love with poetry? Yes, as a little girl, roundabout – well. I love nursery rhymes. I think all children should be read nursery rhymes. I adore them. Mm, absolutely. And then when I was about eight, I used to write poems when, when people got gifts at Christmas and birthdays. And I always used to write them a poem to match their gift because I loved that form of communication. Uh -huh. And I love, I don't know, when I was studying English at school, I love the brevity of poetry and the power of it. And it's just intrigued me. I entered every poetry competition at school, mm -hmm. won some, and it just spoke spoke to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that there must be something in my blood um, that brings out uh, that side of me. You know, the poetry, and mm -hmm. I'm drawn to it. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, um, do you have any formative influences, poets who have influenced you more than others? Um, when I was at school, we had to study some of the, what I thought was boring then, you know, I, I don't believe that people, um, come to, uh, appreciate Shakespeare until they're a bit older and, uh, they can see it in a play. You have to see it in a play. You, and mm. I used to have like, you know, Gray's Elegy, you know, we used to have to read poetry like that. And I thought, you know, this is, that did, it was grueling for me as a 14 year old. But then I came across a poem by uh, Thomas Gray called Ode on the Death of a Favourite Cat Drowned in a Tub of Goldfishes. And I thought, wow, that's so much better than Elegy in a Graveyard. I wonder what that's about. And I dipped myself into Thomas Gray and I fell in love with poetry even more then when I read that poem. For me, it had everything, and it still does. You know, I'm I'm not previously familiar with anything Gray's written other than the elegy. It's you know he's thought of as kind of a one hit wonder, like that's his one canonical work. But it's kind of interesting how I mean, just an injustice how the the good poems of minor poets never get as much attention as even the uh, the, the mediocre poems of great poets. You know, if you have that poem, the about the cat, I do. Would you mind reading that for us? I do, and I'll be, it'll be a pleasure to read it. Ode on the death of a favourite cat, drowned in a tub of goldfishes. Twas on a lofty vase's side, where China's gayest art had died, the azure flowers that blow, demurest of the tabby kind, the pensive Salima reclined, gazed on the lake below. Her conscious tale, her joy declared, the fair round face, the snowy beard, the velvet of her paws. Her coat, that with the tortoise vies, her ears of jet and emerald eyes, she saw and purred applause. Still had she gazed, but midst the tide, two angel forms were seen to glide, the genii of the stream. Their scaly armours, Tyrian hue, through richest purple to the view, betrayed a golden gleam. The hapless nymph with wonder saw, a whisker first, and then a claw, with many an ardent wish. She stretched in vain to reach the prize. What female heart can gold despise? 
what cats averse to fish. Presumptuous maid, with looks intent, again she stretched, again she bent, nor knew the gulf between. Malignant fate sat by and smiled, the slippery verge her feet beguiled, she tumbled headlong in. Eight times emerging from the flood, she mewed to every watery god, some speedy aid to send. No dolphin came, no nerad stirred, nor cruel Tom, nor Susan heard, a favourite has no friend. From hence, ye beauties, undeceived, no one false step is ne'er retrieved, and be with caution bold. Not all that tempts your wandering eyes, and heedless hearts, is lawful prize, nor all that glisters gold. Thank you for that, yes. A bit reminiscent of Pope with the, you know, the triviality of the dead cat compared with like the death of an epic hero. Good mock heroic poem. Yes. Um, and I like now, it for its musicality, mm, like purr yes. applause mm -hmm. and things like that and the pictures it paints. Uh, just really, you know, um, I think it's wonderful. Quite wonderful. Yeah, fun piece. Now, um, you know, Gray is one of these kind of venerable ancient, well, you know, he's not that ancient, but comparatively so, poets. Um, any more modern poets? Of, is there anybody in the contemporary l landscape yes. that you think is worthy of attention that doesn't stink? Surely there have to be a few out there. Do you know, I absolutely love Wendy Cope. She's mm -hmm. a British poet that was born in my hometown. And uh, she um, is a poet. And I think that a lot of her work was in the 80s and 70s when modern poetry was really to the fore. And mm. she likes to use form. And she uses it in a very modern way, you know. It's her, her words are seamless. You wouldn't know that they were in such constraints. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, intrigued me, that you could have a Rondo Redouble or a Villanelle um, or a Triolet or something like that, written in language that engages, amuses, and it's done with such skill. So she is one of my um, poetry head turners, if you like, that is uh, a contemporary poet, yes. Yes, and I think she's still alive, isn't she? She's she's up there, but she's still kicking. Yeah, I think she's in her 70s or something now, but yeah, she definitely is. Yes. I don't suppose you ever ran into her when you were in Kent. I wish I had, yes. Right. Absolutely. That would have been great, you know. But yeah, she did influence me with that, and uh, I've got all of her books, and um, yes. Okay, well, if you have a favourite piece by her, I'd be we'd be happy to hear that one as well. I do, and it's a Villanelle, and I particularly love the Villanelle, um, and uh, I think repetition is very difficult uh, to deal with unless you do it right, and I'm going to mm -hmm. read it and see what you think. It's called June to December, Summer Villanelle. You know exactly what to do, your kiss, your fingers on my thigh. I think of little else but you. It's bliss to have a lover who, touching one shoulder makes me sigh. You know exactly what to do. You make me happy through and through, the way the sun lights up the sky. I think of little else but you. I hardly sleep, an hour or two. I can't eat much and that is why. You know exactly what to do. The movie in my mind is blue as June runs into warm July. I think of little else but you. But is it love and is it true? Who cares? This much I can't deny. You know exactly what to do. I think of little else but you. And I read that in a poetry anthology and it said at the bottom of it that she was lying in her garden and she wrote that instead of doing the weekly shopping. <laughs> Isn't that always how it is? Yeah. My own poem. Yeah. Always putting something aside to write the poem. I can relate to that. <clears throat> but yes, very lovely poem. Uh, lovely poem. She's very witty, extraordinarily witty. Uh, let's see. You have uh, two new poetry collections out, which are your very first poetry collection. So you've been writing poetry for years, for decades here. Yeah. But this is your first collection. So... Uh, Elephants Unleashed is one, and Fern Feathered Edges is yes. the other. 
Um, could you speak a little bit about these? Well, yes. Well, I, I'm really a reluctant uh, publisher and um, people have said to me, when are you going to do your book? I'd like to read your poetry. You know, I'd like it all in a book. And a few friends have said that. People on the site have said that. Um, mm -hmm. The dear James Sale said that. My husband mm -hmm. has nagged and nagged me to do it. And I just like the creative process and just sharing that. But I thought, I'm going to do it. So I did. Um, and I've noticed that um, a lot of my poems are satire. And I'm known mm -hmm. for satire on the society. But I also write poems of beauty. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd bring out two books, one satirical and one of uh, beauty so that, you know, people cannot have both or pick either one, you know. So I went for two at once. So I've done no poetry books for all these years and then I've gone for two. So, but these are my latest poems. I used to write modern poetry as well. It wasn't oh, always... Yes rhyming mm. poetry and since joining the society i have such a respect for rhyme and rhythm and form i always have but mm -hmm. even more so that some of my older poems that i actually did um in a modern form i've changed them to mm. a sonnet and i've had great fun doing that but most of them are uh in the last five or six years yes. but my uh, <laughs> modern poetry you mm. can see it's me you know because i love all the poetic devices i mm. love the bells and whistles i love the internal rhyme i love the alliteration mm. i like all of that and uh it's in there and mm. i love i've come to love editing i didn't used to you know mm. i think that any young poet wants to get their words down and they're very reluctant to change what they've written Mm. But now, looking through some of my old stuff, I actually relish editing. Talk about Elephants Unleashed a little bit, your satirical collection now. In section six of this is yes. titled Gender Agenda. And you do devote about a dozen poems to this madness that is currently tearing our society apart here. And um, you have even been attacked by critics on the left for writing poetry against transgenderism uh those yes. poets will go unnamed but it hasn't seemed to phase you well no i i absolutely think that our children are too young to be considering such things and they are being preyed upon at the moment that is what i feel and i'm with percy bish shelley when he said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world Mm -hmm. And that often, you know, you have all the news articles, the sensationalism, you have all of this. Sometimes when you say it in a poem, um, it hits home, you know, what's happening. And um, it makes a difference. You know, that's what I'm hoping. And, uh, yeah, that that is a subject that bothers me. You know, young people that are confused growing up, you know. It um, it bothers me, and I feel that um, sometimes I sit down to write something beautiful, and I'm called to write something else, and mm -hmm. I do, you know. Okay. And yes, I have been criticised horribly, you know, for not caring for children, you know. Yeah, that's what I they care. always say. Yeah. yeah, but it's because I care. But I care. Um, I've got a different view on the matter um, and I do care. I, I care very much, especially for people with gender dysphoria or people mm. that are confused, um, young people that are confused, that um, are open to um, being preyed upon by those making money from, mm -hmm. um, well, mutilating children, I'm going to say it because that's right. what it is, before they've had a chance to work out who they are. Or what they want. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, is there a poem among that cult set that you would be comfortable reading to us here? Yes, absolutely. And um, it's sort of a, yeah, it's autobiographical really. And um, I'm just glad that I lived in the age that I did. But it's called A Chemistry Lesson. Here goes. There was a time she pined to be a boy. 
around the age of six or maybe eight, when centipedes and beetles were her joy, and skidding knees in trees her frequent fate. There was a time she longed for hair so short, no brush would tear and tug at tangled knots. Her irksome dolls would draw a scornful snort. She'd swap them all for sparring battlebots. There was a time she didn't want to be with loutish lads, those bullish, brawling brats. In dizzy dreams, she breathed the ecstasy of fragrant girls with politess and plaits. There was a time she feared the scarlet bloom and rage and rip of pain bestowed by birth. She cursed the hefty burden of her womb until she knew its wonder and her worth. There was a time she found her mind had lied. She felt a rush and blush so lush and keen, a call to gifts that wouldn't be denied, a tug to all her heart had not foreseen. A pull that led to him, a pledge, a sum, a love that sent confusion on its way. A life she wasn't meant to spurn or shun in times when science didn't pry or pray. In her day, puberty, puberty was never prone to being blocked for thoughts not fully grown. Hmm. You know, I like that this poem is written in the third person to convey a kind of sense of universality rather than the first person. I feel like one problem with a lot of poets today, they write very narcissistic stuff. It's all in the first person. They assume that no one can understand what they're experiencing, right? Which if that were true, would just kind of defeat the purpose of like, why are you going to write a poem at all? But um, you do manage to convey the universal experience of girlhood blossoming into womanhood there. Did you play with battle bots yourself? No, as a youth, I sort of <laughs> did it a bit. they weren't out when I was a kid, but I, I, but no, I didn't like dolls and things like that. You know, I was out with a football climbing trees. I used to collect insects and stuff like that. Um, I loved to have short hair and, you know, I wasn't your typical girl. And when I was at school, you know, when I was 14, um, all the boys in my class, they, they were, uh, yeah. They were awful, you know, and I mm -hmm. did wonder to myself if I was, you know, going to like boys, you know, it did go through my head and I'm sure it goes through many teenagers heads. They become confused. And that is the thing that I don't like. I think children should be left alone to go through puberty, you know, and the thing that I am bothered by is puberty blockers before you've had a chance to grow you know and they're not reversible and i just believe that children of today are in danger um of making huge mistakes you know mm -hmm. if they're not allowed to smoke they're not allowed to drink they're not allowed to get married they're not allowed to have sex how can they choose which gender they want to be mm -hmm. so right i feel very strongly about that so um i just think poetry is a good vehicle Maybe if a girl, a teenager read that, she might think, I feel just like that. And look what happened to that girl. She went on to have children, do you know? Uh, and and that's, um, that's how I think, you know. Now let's see. <clears throat> Elephants Unleashed does tackle a variety of topics on satirical subjects here. Are there any others that are particularly close to your heart? Of course, it's all close to your heart because you wrote all the poems, obviously. That was a serious poem, but there are fun ones as well. And I absolutely love fun language to get a point across. You know, I, I like to keep an eye on politics and what's going on. And it inspires me, you know, a lot of the time to write. And I have a poem here called Brimstone. I'll just read it and, you know, let you hear I sniff a whiff of brimstone in the tone of smooth effusions oozing from his tongue. A lick of sulphur clings like stale cologne to slickest syntax, eloquently strung like lustrous pearls to wrap around the throat that swallows every sickening cliché. The polished bleating from a cheating goat is honed to lead the sweetest sheep astray. 
I hear his cloven hoof, tap to the beat of hapless hearts, all fed the plumpest pledge. That putrid fruit, the dupe to lure to eat, from lips that push the sanest to the edge. The nightingale croons by the moonlit form. Another politician has been born. <laughs> That's good. That last line really clinches it. A fun poem. Lots of good wordplay. I, I that. think that the the Shakespearean sonnet is a really good form for that mm. type of uh, you know message. Fourteen lines, you know, with your turn and then your closing couplet. I think it's just mm. the right you know size to get um, a point across, or for for many different subjects as well. I I really quite like. Now, that. do you have any? advice that you would give to new poets young poets people aspiring to the traditions people trying to make it in the po biz today i think um any young poet poet uh thinking of embarking upon uh writing their own i would say first of all read 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 you know get to know different forms lots of different poetry that you like um you know, get to know your craft as well, you know, dabble in a bit of form, you know, whatever you fancy, just learn about it and read. Um, it will speak to you. And I would say that when you write, don't write for other people, write for yourself. And somebody from the uh, SCP always says to write, somebody I admire always says to write fearlessly. Mm -hmm. So, don't be inhibited when you write, you know. Um, I think that uh, as soon as you start thinking of others and an audience, uh, you um, um, cut back your voice. You don't find your own voice. So mm. write fearlessly. Um, and that is another thing, yes. And in doing that, you will find your voice. I think, and this is just for me, that when you're writing a poetry, your message um, is important. You know, you have to think of what you want to say, even if it's something mystical and obscure, you know, the message should be, you know, what you're saying to your reader should be the most important thing to come across. And all the bells and whistles are secondary to that. Because if you start thinking, I'm going to uh, use alliteration there and I'm going to do this there, you can lose the message, it can get swallowed up, and it can sound forced. So I think that um, the message should be important. But as I say, that's just me. All poets are different. But really, uh, never stop reading. Um, write fearlessly and know your craft as well. Even, mm. if, um, even if you think you don't like uh, traditional poetry, have a go. Try and write one read them you might be pleasantly surprised you know so um yeah keep open-minded as well i think mm -hmm. that um poets i think as well should always look at life from the angle that might not have been viewed you, you, you know uh, look at things differently uh, give a different picture of uh, the cliched and the mundane that's always. great advice um as far as personal project goals what does the future hold for you are we going to see any more collections in the future yes. of some of your other work yes, that hasn't I, seen I the did. light of day yet? Yes, I'm doing another book at the moment, and it's called Hearts and Larks, and mm -hmm. it's about love, loss, and laughter. So I thought, you know, people love love, and they like to read about loss as well, and and the antidote to that is laughter. So there will be a bit of everything in the next book. Okay, what can we expect that out? I'm working on it now. So I think probably by the end of the year. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Well, a lot going on. I'm glad you're certainly staying busy here. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're out of time here, Susan, but thanks for coming on. It's been great talking to you. And we'll have to maybe have you back on when you've got when your new book comes out. I mean, that's wonderful. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Andrew. All right. Thank you, Susan. Okay. That was Susan Jarvis Bryant and her books are available on Amazon 
where, of course, everything else is available. I should also say that although this is a Society of Classical Poets podcast, I have now launched a separate YouTube channel that is separate from the Society of Classical Poets YouTube channel, and that is Classical Poets Live. These regular episodes will be occurring on a fortnightly basis. I hesitate to say bi-weekly because bi-weekly could actually mean either twice a week or once every two weeks. So it's kind of confusing. So it's fortnightly. In between those episodes, I will also be recording poetry readings that I'm doing of contemporary classical poets. So you can check those out on the YouTube channel as well. And please subscribe. When I return in two weeks, I will be interviewing James Sale, England's foremost living epic poet. So I will see you then. Thank you.